Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good night, good abend, good morgen, wherever you happen to be, welcome to our uh, next keynote slash plenary session. Uh, I'm very pleased to actually be able to uh, do this introduction. I've known Stuart for many years. Uh, Stuart is the owner, director, beer of all things of a mobile partner in New Zealand uh, called HRDNZ, uh, which for those of you who don't speak Kiwi is pronounced Hundens. Um, Stuart is actually seen as, in the Moodle community as, as one of the experts, especially on the business side of things. It's not his only focus, and I'll let him explain that. But when it does come towards you know, Moodle and the enterprise, um, Stuart's been one of the first and, and still one of the major innovators in that space. And so when it came to looking for plenaries, we really wanted to make sure that that sector wasn't ignored. And we specifically targeted Stuart to ask if he would be kind enough to do a keynote. And as you know, this is actually about Moodle, open, and business trends and challenges, because the work, especially in the business world, you know, business and open aren't two terms that necessarily go together very well. So without much further ado or embarrassment, I'd like to pass the floor over to our keynote, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Julian. I'm having trouble with my unmute button there. Um, probably a repetitive strain injury to my index finger. Um, thank you all for coming to this session. Um, I, I must admit, I did wonder who would come to this session, which is why I've asked that question um, while we're waiting in the, in the chat window. Tell us if you're a, a teacher, a techie, a manager, maybe you are a, a trainer, Maybe you're a HR consultant. Maybe you're a jack of all trades. Maybe you're independent. Um, yeah, all things to everyone. Um, because this session is definitely not uh, about learning about Moodle. Um, there have been some fantastic sessions that, are, that I've been to so far. Uh, people teaching the functionality of Moodle or the philosophy behind Moodle, or even you know, the wider concepts of, of education and MOOCs and, and so on. And um, this isn't any of that. This is something quite different. Um, I'm expecting people to be uh, offended at some of this, but, or challenged, or, or uh, questioned. It's, um, I don't really like talking to a screen or a, a little green light or even a microphone. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna switch my camera off at this point just to, uh, um, <laughs> the picture of me lends nothing to the presentation, let, let me say that. Um, so I'm gonna switch my uh, camera off um, and um, hopefully save a bit of bandwidth. Because, of course, I'm in New Zealand, so, so this has to go uphill to everywhere else in the world. Um, so apart from Teresa, who <laughs> I think is lower down in New Zealand than I am. Um, so I'm just going to turn my camera off. OK, downhill, yeah. Um, OK, so challenges. This was the, um, oops. This was the um, brief that I was given. Um, this, is, this is almost a cut and paste from the email from Julian, I think. Um, with the official iMOOC theme being open, we thought you'd be well placed to keynote on the challenges faced in corporates when dealing with issues such as open source, open resources, open education, MOOCs, and social discussions in corporate spaces. And how you are seeing these shift, or not shift as the case may be, with some examples of how things are or are not changing. Well, um, I was going to do an hour on how things are not changing, because I thought that would be really easy. I just take some screenshots of, uh, of big universities from from five years ago and what they're doing today, and say, look, nothing's changing. Uh, that would be that would be quite easy. Um, that's a that's a big question. That's a hard question. Um, it, it raises so many different points that um, we can only hope to perhaps raise some of these issues and highlight some of these things in your minds and maybe um, look at some of these things quite 
tangentially and, and try and think outside the box a little bit. hate that expression, but uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, so I didn't know what the, the what the emoticon for extremely heavy irony is. Um, so if anyone knows it, I guess you can type it in the chat or you can tell me later. Um, so this, I, I would really like this to be a presentation and discussion. Um, I, I, I'm really, really happy to pass the microphone in the second half. Um, I've, I've been to a few sessions uh, where people said they were going to do that, but um, didn't have their mics or, or were a bit shy or, and so on. Um, there's a few names I recognise in here of people that are not very shy. Um, so if you'd like to, to contribute, and you can, you can do that in the chat, of course. Um, but if you want to, to jump in at some point, that's absolutely great. I'd really like that. Um, because of that statement in the middle there, I did my teacher training when I was kind of 21-ish, 24-ish, and um, had a great, a great teacher who told me that the greatest resource you ever have as a teacher are the other people in the room. And that's kind of one of the things that I've never, ever forgotten. And it's one of the things that I always try to operate on. Um, whatever I know and whatever I can share is, is just a tiny fraction compared to the rest of the knowledge we have here right now. So um, yeah, do contribute in the chat and, and do if you if you want to, if you're able to, um, get on the mic as that opportunity arises. So have I gone to no, no, that's fine. Um, I will be sort of um, capturing or, or, and, and developing whatever we discuss here. Um, I have an area on, on our free Moodle site, which is a kind of welcome to using Moodle and business. And in there, there's just lots of things all about SCORM or, or um, conditional activities for training or uh, lessons or, or how you can integrate audio in a, in a business context. So there's lots of stuff in there. And this idea of what can we do in terms of open and business would, would be a new focus. So I am going to sort of develop that further uh, within there afterwards, just to let you know that. So uh, just a quick about me, because I guess if you understand my background and where I come from, it kind of makes some of these statements and, and opinions, uh, it gives them a, a grounding, I suppose. Um, yeah, I'm Managing Director of uh, HRDNZ, and we've been a Moodle partner since 2006. Um, we have our HQ in New Zealand, but we've always been quite a global company. We always work with people around the world. That's um, something that's, that's, that's been right from the beginning. Um, and part of that, I guess, is, is back to my qualifications, um, because I have that MBA in international business. I, I always thought of business or whatever my company was going to do as being international. I, I never felt um, constrained or, or limited to wherever I happened to be living at the time in terms of what I was going to do. Um, some of that, I think, comes from when, when we were growing up. I mean, I'm, I'm mid-40s, and, um, you know, when we were at school, science was a big thing. And um, I always thought we were going to live in big glass domes under the sea, or that we, or we'd be living in space. Um, so I never felt constrained. I always thought the world was my play area, and um, and uh, international never bothered me. So I was, I feel more part of the world than I feel a specifically a New Zealander or specifically a UK person. Um, you may know me from being facilitator on Moodle.org in various areas for certification and the database and business uses. And um, I do have a sort of central role with Moodle, which is as the Moodle, the OCCC manager, which is the Moodle course creator certificate. Um, you can see a few people in here I know who have that. And um, that would be a separate presentation, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, all my um, well, some of my little text boxes have moved around, unfortunately, during the um, conversion. But um, we organised the Moodle Moot New Zealand each year. This is something that I'm particularly proud of. We have um, five PHMs, um, which is particularly helpful Moodlers. So although we're a business, 
you know, we make money and so on. Um, all our top people are all right in there in the Moodle community helping for free. Um, Mary L over in uh, Mexico, obviously doing a lot of work in the Spanish speaking communities. Uh, Anna, who's in Greece and looks after sort of Europe and the Middle East region for us. Um, Miriam, who many people know, um, is co-facilitator now of the themes forum on Moodle.org. Teresa, who um, PHM probably as long as any of us, and um, you know, huge contributor on Moodle.org, and also in fact one of the top testers of Moodle. So as new versions of Moodle are released and people test it, um, Teresa's right in there doing um, absolutely sterling work. And, and I probably don't say this often enough or publicly enough, but I'm incredibly proud of these people actually making those contributions. You know, it's absolutely uh, great to work with these people. So um, I guess my first question is that, I mean, the theme here about Moodle and open and business um, is, is this even possible? Um, you know, that there have got to be some tensions here. There have got to be some restrictions uh, around business being open in the same way that perhaps mainstream education. Um, and if business can be open or more open, what, what would it look like? What shape would that take? Um, and how can it hold advantages for business? Because a business can't suddenly say, yeah, we're going to make all our stuff open. All our knowledge, we're going to make it open. And that's just not going to work in business. Um, a couple of little business terms there, SWOT and PEST analysis. That's how I think of these challenges. Um, they are fairly basic strategic management tools. Um, and, and also thinking about some examples as well. Okay. So hopefully everyone can still hear me okay. It's very quiet in the old um, chat room there. Um, so there are a number of drivers, I guess, for for openness. Um, first of all, social driver, this desire to be open, um, usually for the benefit of other people. And um, I think that's something that's very strong in the Moodle community, and it's very strong in that whole um, OER space, open educational resources, that just the social desire to be open to help other people. Cool. Um, there are technical drivers, I think, which um, you know, we could argue that YouTube and, and Twitter and, and whatever, uh, all these technologies make it easier to be open. Um, I'd argue that's not necessarily the case, and that, and that, you know, from the very beginning of the internet, the whole point was about being open. And the fact that the internet over the past, um, what, 10 years, 15 years, the fact that it moved from being a, a, an academic tool for sharing into a marketing space, uh, which is what it felt like kind of five years ago. You know, the whole dot com, everyone was business, everything was sales. I mean, you, could, you can't go on a website without finding advertising. Um, uh, and now I think it is starting to morph more into a, a, a you know, a user driven environment. Um, so technology is having an, an effect there. There are political um, trends as well and drivers for this openness from government, for example, to make uh, information more accessible. And economic, I'm going to leave that one for now. Um, we will come back to that because we're going to talk about business, so it's okay to talk about money. So um, the, the, the whole thing of, of the free software movement I think is an interesting uh, point to look at first. Um, the free software movement was officially launched in 1983. Um, there were lots of, for those of us who've been involved with computing um, for many years, the idea of this uh, open software, you know, we had donationware and shareware and freeware and all these different um, types of software. If you're relatively new to computing, you kind of missed out on those early days. I saw a really nice discussion in the chat in one of the other sessions about people talking about five and a half inch floppy disks and loading things from cassette. Um, you know, things have, have changed an awful lot. Um, so what were the benefits? Yeah, old timers. What were the um, 
benefits here to doing that? Uh, well, I've, well, I fell into two categories really: um, a practical or technological reason that that we could then share code and get other people contributing. Um, that's something that's difficult to do while everything's locked down. Um, and also social reasons. Um, the people involved in open source software um, are a particular type of people. You know, they are maybe a little bit rebellious, maybe a little bit non-conformist, and socially there were some um, some drivers there. Um, there's some links there if you want to read more about about the free software movement and the Software Foundation. Um, uh, in fact, the, the Software Foundation was um, set up by Richard Stallman, who actually came to New Zealand uh, last year or the year before. I think I actually didn't have a chance to go and see him, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but you know, the whole idea of developers um, releasing their code and sharing their code and making it public. Um, Richard Stallman's very much at the the one extreme that everything should be open. Um, other people are more conservative in their approach. And I might say, well, some things should be open. You know? Some things should be shared. Um, of course, one piece of one piece of software that that's open source that everyone here knows, uh, Moodle. Uh, and I guess most people don't read the uh, open software agreement uh, in Moodle, and that's because we're so used to installing software um, or updating iTunes with you know hundreds of pages of text that we all read in detail until we get to the box that says I agree and I understand. Um, no one reads these things. Um, but the important bit there is, you know, that even though Moodle's a piece of software, anyone and everyone is allowed to copy it and use it and modify it, provided that that when we do that, we we pass it on to other people in that same way, so that other people can have the same benefits that we have. And um, you know, that's that's really the essential concept here, isn't it? Um, the license itself stops people from benefiting themselves without paying that forward that benefit to other people and that that's one of you know that's why it's so great and um, I'll just put a note there and um, for people that are new to Moodle sometimes they think that well what does that mean in terms of the content we deliver uh, or the content we create well no I mean that's your content it's not that that content isn't suddenly uh, doesn't have to be open source so it's quite okay for you to be a a private training company using Moodle and making money from the courses you sell. That's okay. Um, there's lots of popular open source software that we use all the time. Um, and maybe not even realizing that some of this is open source. Um, things like WordPress. Um, I'm sure that if you just if you just raise your hand or put a yes in the old uh, chat box if you're a WordPress user. Uh, I'm personally not because I don't do a lot of blogging. Um, I'm not anti-blogging. I'm just I just find it really difficult to <laughs> to have that discipline to blog regularly enough for it to be worthwhile uh, for anyone else to read. Um, Mozilla Firefox probably the most popular browser in terms of free choice. Um, I think that um, you know a lot of people obviously in corporates in uh, large environments are stuck with the old uh, Internet Explorer and um, Chrome of course getting getting more popular but yeah I think Firefox still uh, extremely strong. Audacity if you're a teacher you may use this to do uh, audio audio stuff, um, recording and editing, GIMP for photo retouching, GIMP is almost as powerful as um, Photoshop these days, there's, there's even a version of GIMP, I think it's called GIMP Photo, which um, allows you to put all your menus in GIMP in exactly the same order as they are in, in Photoshop, which is, which is quite cool. Um, others that we may know, um, BLC, 
which is a, a media player, and it'll play just about anything, um, whether they, you know, and you can install it on Linux or the Mac or a PC. And um, yeah, everyone that comes across VLC eventually loves it. It's, it's hugely, it's hugely fantastic. Um, OpenOffice and, and LibreOffice, you know, these are two suites that can do pretty much everything that Microsoft Office could can do. Um, and I pulled out that little statement, that little quote from LibreOffice that says, LibreOffice is about more than software. It's about people, it's about culture, it's about creation, sharing, and collaboration. Um, that's interesting, John, standardizing on LibreOffice at the school, fantastic. Um, that statement, you know, if I read that statement on the Apple site, or I read it on the Microsoft site, I would look at it and think, that's fine, some marketing person has just thought that up and it looks cool and it's tested well with a, with a, with a public you know, investigation and, and everyone's cool with this. But when that's written that way from a open source organization, it's kind of like Moodle saying, look, Moodle's about people, it's about teaching, you know, and it, ha it has some validity there. Um, the last two I've mentioned there are FreeMind and Blender. Um, FreeMind, again, quite popular with teachers. There are a couple of others alongside FreeMind. Um, mind mapping tools that are open source and, and, you know, getting better and better with every release. A little bit rugged around the edges sometimes. And Blender, which is a fantastically powerful 3D image tool. and um, yeah, uh, I know Miriam's around. I don't know whether Miriam uses Blender. Um, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I must admit, I've tried it myself and find it a little bit difficult. Uh, and even with a background in graphic design, I still find it a bit a bit difficult. But um, certainly, uh, you know, we, we can see there's a whole landscape of open source software out there um, doing great jobs. Um, and in fact, there's quite a lot of stuff in the background as well. Um, we probably don't realize, most people, I think, um, are probably completely oblivious to the fact that the internet pretty well runs on open source software. Um, a Apache web server, um, probably some estimates there, two thirds of all web servers on the internet are running Apache. It's free, it's open source. MySQL, a database system. That database system is, well, it has a community version and a standard professional edition, which you can pay for. But um, I would suggest that most of these sites around the world, about 5 million sites, you know, using MySQL, an open source database. And, and these are not, you know, these are big clients, these are big people. PHP, um, just so widespread these days. Um, and uh, Linux, I'm, you know, kind of mentioning um, Linux there. Linux is huge in the in the server arena and, and always has been. Um, far less so on the desktop, you know. Estimates are possibly two percent of computer desktops around the world running Linux, and um, of those, probably half of those running Ubuntu. And if you've never used Linux, and if if, if this uh, session makes you more interested to go out and look at it. Uh, Ubuntu is a great place to start. It's a it's a pretty user friendly uh, interface. Um, yeah, Mint, as uh, Richard said, is a is a version of Ubuntu. Um, Ubuntu itself is actually kind of um, referred back to uh, to Debian days in a way. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, it's it's there. It'll do exactly the same things as Windows or Mac OS does, and um, and it's fun. Yeah. So certainly our lives, whether that's our our social lives and our Facebook use and our our. our you know, keeping in touch with friends and just socializing on the internet, or whether it's business, um, open source software is enabling this to happen in a much greater way than, than the average person on the street realizes. Um, it might not be the case for the people in this room. Uh, many of the people in this room are involved with technology and education and kind of get this, hopefully. Um, one of the other drives I mentioned was, was open government, and um, 
the open government is is more about the government's responsibility to be open with the citizens, you know, you and I. Um, it is it is thought that Scandinavian countries were the first to, to kind of develop this real open approach to government, um, and, and maybe even going back to the sort of seventeenth and eighteenth century with the uh, the age of enlightenment and the age of reason, which was kind of I guess following on from uh, in parallel to the Renaissance and people's understanding that that society wasn't just about power in the hands of the few and that and that more people could get involved in a community. Um, so so we can trace the, the open government back. Um, in New Zealand, I'm going to refer to New Zealand a couple of times just because I can obviously get to. Uh, the information and I, I know the environment quite well. Um, here in New Zealand, you know, we have a, a, an, an open government uh, policy in terms of data. Um, the Green Party, who um, I have to say are very unlikely to get into power on their own, but could quite easily get into power in coalition. Um, they have a very strong, um, strong view on openness, um, and I guess that links to their environmental roots, um, I didn't mean roots as a, as a pun there, but um, for the Green Party, you know, very much about society first and uh, profit second, perhaps, or maybe that's, that's um, you know, uh, an oversimplification. Uh, um, in the USA, we have government drivers for, for this openness, making all documents open. Um, this doesn't surprise us, I guess, that the UK and the US might be two of the two of the um, countries, two of the governments that are moving towards this this uh, policy and this, this this kind of approach. Um, even you know, the United States Environmental Protection Agency has lots of uh, information on on transparency and participation and collaboration. And isn't it interesting that some of those words, you know, culture of transparency and participation and collaboration, they're the same kind of words that we hear with Moodle and with open source software. And there's clearly a, a parallel there. Um, the UK, same type of thing, you know, lots of Lots of fair, and fairly recent as well, you know, from kind of 2010, lots of these governments starting to to take this more seriously. And I guess some of them are thinking of it as a vote winner. Um, yeah, the White House runs on Drew Powell. Excellent, thanks for that, John. Um, this was a nice example though from Italy, which, not to disparage Italy, I don't automatically think of Italy as being at the front of um, social social uh, democracy and 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 te technological use, um, but um, in, in just in March this year, um, all of the court data from from Italy is now available online, um, including eighteen thousand texts of all verdicts from nineteen fifty six, which <laughs> which I thought was was pretty amazing. Um, I certainly can't get that in New Zealand. I, I can't think of anywhere else uh, where I would be able to get that level of, of data. And I know it's a very specific thing, you know. You know, um, it, it's the courts, and perhaps they have I don't know, better record keeping than than other parts of of government. But um, a really interesting development there, I think. Um, so let's move a little bit closer to Moodle. Um, moving closer to Moodle, at least e-learning, and think a little bit about open education. So we've seen we've seen uh, open open software, and we've seen the move to, to more open government. So what about open education? This is this is an area we should all be quite quite um, familiar with. Well, the first thing I did is I just looked around for definitions of of OER and, and what it means, and it obviously means slightly different things to different people. Um, but as I look through these uh, definitions, there are there are some words which clearly come through again and again. Um, words like use and reuse, obviously words like free, 
words like distribution. Um, some more on the next page here. Um, some of these might refer to digitized content, for example. Uh, but that would be because uh, the body making this definition is, is more concerned, perhaps, with digital or computing or, or IT worlds. Other, um, other bodies, like, like uh, from the Cape Town, open declarations saying that people who, are, who have disabilities or we should have it available in different formats because not everyone has a computer. It's a much wider definition, of course. So, um, although there are all these different definitions, um, I think the key words which, which come through for all of us are, are, you know, available for our use, reuse, adaption, editing, sharing. You know, we kind of know these words. We get these words now. And... Um, Certainly, OER a big factor in the educational landscape right now. Okay, um, I'm 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 going to mention a couple of organisations uh, as I go through this, but um, certainly not not trying to pick on any anyone. Um, I remember a few years ago when there was a there was quite a big big um, press release and, and a lot of buzz about the fact that the Open University had this uh, open courseware initiative and suddenly all this course material was going to be out there for free. Um, and I looked at it and I thought it was rubbish. Uh, most of it was text. Most of it seemed a little bit out of date. Um, it certainly wasn't something that, that I saw instantly as engaging or even hugely valuable. Um, and I say that as someone, I used to work for the Open University as um, a tutor counsellor, and I think the Open University is the most fantastic, um, you know, example of some of the best practice and just wonderful, wonderful organisation. Um, but just releasing all their material, um, didn't kind of have the huge effect and, and, and positive that I thought it was going to. And last week I actually checked that you know the the the, uh, the OER at the Open University, and there's a really interesting statement there that says we're going to give five percent of our resources each year away. Um, now that's a big change from a hundred percent. It's about a ninety-five percent change by. I <laughs> reckoning. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I'm certainly not connected enough to know um, why that why that doesn't uh, why that change. Um, but what it does, I've just made a, a sort of comment about a parallel approach. And um, maybe giving something away for free is is good is good marketing. Um, I'm not sure what the the benefits might be uh, at this stage, but it's interesting to, to notice that that change there with you know it's one of the world's biggest educators. Um, we also, of course, a couple of years ago, the other big news item in this area, I suppose, more or less the same time, was was the fact that Massachusetts Institute of Technology gave all that made all there content available and I'm kind of thinking so did MIT did in fact the Open University have lower student numbers the year after and the reality is no um, because those materials do not suddenly mean that your business model is no longer uh, viable not if you are a big well-known arguably top of the league educational establishment. People are not coming to you just for your content. They're coming to you for the environment, for the professors, for the qualifications, for the classmates. They're coming to you for lots of other reasons. And, and the notes of a lecturer are not the biggest reason. Um, if they were, then both of these organisations would have collapsed after releasing everything. That, uh, so we know that's not the case. Um, 
I've kind of said that. So, so it's easy for these big institutions to do it, but could um, you know could smaller private training companies do this? If um, I know we've got some people here who are who who said that they are independent trainers or working in 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 companies. They may be training companies. They may be other types of companies. Um, could we could we afford to give all this away? Um, let's think about that. In my um, sort of preparation, <coughs> in my preparation for this, I, I looked around obviously at a lot of uh, publications and did, did quite a bit of reading. And um, you know, the Commonwealth, uh, the, the CLO there, talking about um, the business case for open educational resources. And there are lots of studies, and there are lots of websites, and lots of papers on this area, uh, particularly during the last three years, maybe. <clears throat> What's interesting is that these are all from organisations that are big, and that wouldn't collapse overnight just because all their course materials are available freely. Um, and I've also made a note there that if you are if you are funded by government, funded by public money in any way, then it's 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 relatively easy for you to say, "Ah, oh, open open educational resources. Everything should be open. It's fantastic." It's easy to say if your business is not going to collapse overnight because of you doing that. For smaller businesses, I think we have a very different situation. Yeah, thanks, Gavin. Gavin's just saying I, I give away some things as Creative Commons and, and not other things, business case depending. And that, that's a really good point, and it's it's kind of where we're driving here. Uh, absolutely, it's one of the, one of the key points. So here's some thoughts about the business and commercial sector being open. Um, first of all, the the reason for being a business is to make money. Okay, that, that's a very different reason for, of existence than a university or a school. Yeah, the point of a business is that we have to make money to survive, and businesses, when they're successful, will build some financial assets and expand and diversify and maybe collaborate and partner. Um, but the ultimate point of a business is to generate income and make money. That's how it works. Um, for many of these organisations, like if you're a private training company, let's just say you're teaching um, like computing or travel and tourism or alternative medicine, the biggest asset that you have in that organisation is your knowledge. If you just give your knowledge away, that's, that's the scariest point you could possibly be at, because that's your greatest asset. Forget the building that you lease. Forget the staff that that turn over every few years. Uh, forget your brand loyalty. It's actually the knowledge that your organisation has and utilises on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, third point: business is a competitive environment. In business, we're used to competing all the time. Um, it's not necessarily always dog eat dog, but we are always aware of what competitors are doing and how that's going to affect us. Um, and a little comment there that I don't think universities and schools are in this space at all. I don't think that that they are competing. They may compete, for example, to universities with a, with a similar course, and you know they want they want as many students as possible. Um, but in fact, even that argument falls down because in most countries you'll find that the universities are capped. And that there are government controls to make sure that only so many students are allowed to go to each university for each course. And that's a kind of government and local education authority method to keep some level of stability in these, in these huge organisations. Um, if every student in New Zealand was allowed to choose without any problem the university they wanted to go to, irrespective of distance and cost, I think we'll go from 
like 14 universities to probably six. And I, and I think that would happen in, in many other countries as well. So schools are different again. Um, schools, you know, logistically need to be smaller, need to have that catchment area, and they don't compete in, in any real sense of the word, uh, other than you know for, for, for good teachers and good students. But but they're not going to they're not going to compete in a in a in a true business sense. Um, okay, I'm not sure whether people are agreeing or disagreeing with um with, with this. Yeah, and that's a good point actually. That you know the um the the ranking of schools and um, I know that in New Zealand there's been a move to actually remove some of that ranking from the from the published data on schools each year because um, government is really concerned that that ranking is going to lead to some schools being um, viable and other schools not being viable. Now, um, if if we were a business, if we were in a true competitive environment, we would say. Who cares? Let everyone choose the school, and if one school has to close, that's okay because that's market forces. So as soon as we take away that data from from parents, we're actually again just reinforcing that non-business environment, that non-competitive environment. Um, <clears throat> there's some good comments in the um, in, in in the chat, and I'm trying to sort of uh, weave some of those in as we go. Uh, so um, we have a couple of areas for where we try to develop this area of Moodle in business. Um, there's a Moodle in business course on Moodle.org. That's the first link there, and um, that that needs redeveloping. It needs updating. Uh, and uh, as one of the people responsible for that, I put my hand up and say, yeah, you know, that's on the job list. We need to make that better. Um, we have a, a Moodle and business area on, on free Moodle, and there are also various uh, business uses um, areas or, or groups and so on on LinkedIn and um, Facebook and whatever. Um, I, I think there are possibly a few too many, and maybe we should try and consolidate some of these. Um, we obviously, you know, we will we'll get benefits from from more people in discussing in the same spaces, I guess. Um, you could argue with the, with the connectivity that that's not really necessary because people can subscribe to one and, and RSS to another and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so yeah, so academics. So, so the academics are kind of saying, you know, we should share everything. Um, I'm saying I don't think that's realistic outside of uh, areas that are supported financially and outside of areas that are not competitive, not, not competitive in a true business sense. Um, saying it's good and we should all do it is, is something that only people with, um, with a, uh, what's that thing when you fall off a tightrope, like a net underneath? <laughs> Yeah, if you've got a net underneath that you know is going to catch you, or if you know you're going to be paid every week anyway, regardless of the fact of what, what you do, safety net, thanks, Teresa. Um, you know, in business, we don't have that safety net. Uh, you know, our businesses can disappear overnight. Um, uh, that's true for anything. You know? Okay. Um, but I did then start to think about not-for-profits and charities. Um, because these are these are in the private sector, but they're not um, public schools and universities and so on. Um, so, so there should, in theory, be be very little impact from not for profits and charities sharing their knowledge because their aim is not to make money. Their aim is to is not to gather and retain and build wealth. It's actually to use the wealth that they generate in in charitable ways. Um, so these guys should be able to share without the same problems that, that a straightforward business might have. So again, I've, I've just picked a, a, an example here in New Zealand, um, which is the Environment, Environment and Conservation Organisations. So this is basically a group of, of uh, 50 to 60 organisations all around New Zealand, all involved with different aspects of conservation and the environment. 
And um, under this umbrella, and that's this umbrella organization that tries to support these different organizations. And they've now got a Moodle site. And that Moodle site is then able to benefit all of those different organizations by providing them with training, by providing them with forums to discuss their issues, by providing them with glossaries for definitions or databases for contact lists or you know they can actually use Moodle as as a group to facilitate that communication and that sharing and that learning and uh, I don't know, it's a really fascinating uh, little case study um, and, and I sort of know about them because we're a Moodle partner and we're hosting their site and we're helping them set this up and um, you know I think it's a real real interesting one to watch for me over the next year or two about how that develops and, and how well it works. I think it's an interesting little model. Um, I also want to, I guess, talk a little bit about us and how we work because, like I've said from the beginning, we are a business. Um, we're a commercial company. We make money. Um, we're a Moodle partner, so we're actually extremely proud of the fact that, that we support Moodle financially. You know, We actually put our hand in our back pocket every time we invoice a client and we pay a percentage to Moodle, and we're, we're totally happy with that. And, and I tell you what, it's the, only, it's the only check I sign each month that makes me smile. You know? um, but even saying that, we can still have a parallel approach. Not everything we have to do not everything we do has to make money. Um, some of the things might have a payback, but even if they don't, uh, that doesn't matter. As long as, it, as long as we understand what we're doing uh, in this parallel approach. So maybe some of the things we do are absolutely and totally focused on making money. Other things we do are, are totally not focused on making money, but if we make some money from that as, a, as an accident or a byproduct or as an unforeseen uh, unforeseen factor, that's fine. <laughs> well, obviously it's fine, um, but it's not the point. It's, it's um, you know, if it, if it happens, it's great. Um, so just to mention a few things. So we have, uh, one of the things we're known for, I guess, is our Moodle training courses, our Moodle Bytes. And we have courses in there for teachers and course designers and administrators and theme designers and MySQL reporters. And um, a couple of years ago, we were approached by an organization who said, can we, can we take your courses and put them on our, on our site? And uh, you can kind of imagine my instant response to that was, was absolutely not. I mean, you know, um, we worked damn hard on producing these courses. And, but then, I think being open to the way we change our business models is important. So I kind of thought about that a bit more. And the reality is that although we run these courses online and they're fantastic and blah, 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 this particular client wanted to deliver the courses themselves with their own trainers on their own time scale, which was different to ours. And they wanted to, for example, hide everything about lessons and work workshops and they wanted to add something else in and they wanted it branded so it looked like it was their own work and um, from that point we actually developed a totally new side to our business which was licensing the courses so that a large university or a large corporate can come to us and say we'd like to license your courses and we literally give them the backups of our courses and they're then license to run those with unlimited numbers of their staff within their institution. So that was something that I hadn't imagined when we first created all these courses. But I think it, it, it illustrates that you do have to be open to new models of business each, each, each time you're approached and each time it's something new. Um, at the same time, we do lots of things that are for free and, and we're really happy to do this. So this is the parallel approach. We have sites like um, dev.moodlebytes. And on there, we maintain about 50 Moodle plugins. Um, we'd like it to be 100. Um, and these are plugins that are all working. Because I don't know if, you, if you've noticed, if you've ever gone to moodle.org and looked for plugins, you can kind of read about them. And you might be able to download them. And if you're an administrator, that's cool, because you can install them and test them. But if you're just a teacher, you actually can't do that. 
So we thought this site would be useful um, so that ordinary teachers can actually see what they do. Um, and um, I, I kind of that site actually started because we needed to see, as a business, what these plugins did, and to be able to demonstrate them to clients or discuss them with clients at least. Um, so, so that went from being something that we had to do for ourselves to being something that we could do for the wider community. Um, I'm not going to mention uh, Free Moodle too much, just to say that Free Moodle is one of our projects. And it's a site that offers free Moodle hosting, but only for courses that are free and open to others. And um, I'm just going to leave it at that. We've got a presentation about the free Moodle project um, tomorrow. If, if that's of interest to you, please come along. We'd love to see you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but, you know, examples of things that we do uh, for free for people. Couple more. I, I mentioned that we have PHMs, and bear in mind that PHMs are people uh, giving their time um, for free. We also have a, a YouTube channel, and that's quite interesting if you've not seen that. Um, we have a YouTube channel, and you can see the address there. And all the movies that we create for our online courses are all there for free, uh, public access. Yeah, so um, not every movie from every course, because we didn't start this um, process till about two years ago. Um, but um, can I pop it into the chat? I can't, because I can't copy and paste from here. It's just an image, unfortunately, Dot. Um, but um, you'll be able to, to, to replay this. Or just search for HRDNZ Moodle Partner on, um, on um, YouTube. Um, so we've had, you know, 100,000 views, 800 subscribers, but I kind of look at those subscribers and, and at least half of them are just people trying to subscribe to things so they get noticed, you know, that whole link mentality. Um, but, um, you know, oh, thanks, Teresa. <laughs> um, we're happy to do that. And, and let, let me go on and discuss why and think about that a little bit more. And I know that people like Gavin will probably be able to jump in here with comments. So. If, if we give away all the movies from our courses, and remember our courses are one of our biggest points of income, our online courses. If we give away all the movies for there, what, what does that mean? Does it pay back? Um, if it pays back, are we able to sort of measure, measure that? Um, and if there is a benefit, you know, does that mean other people can get the same benefit by employing the same strategy? Yeah, the capitals are important. Um, um, and ultimately, I have to say, even though I'm a businessman, the measurement of of how how these things are working can't just be financial. It has to be about wider concepts. Like, if people discover our our movies and they like them and they're useful, does that create a level of brand loyalty? Does it make people think nice things about our company? Is there a pay forward there? Um, is it possible that some of these people will come and sign up for courses later, or talk to us about consultancy, or, or hire, yeah, hire us for something else? Um, <clears throat> I think it's important. Excuse me. I think it's important um, that it is very public evidence of our of our ethical approach, and you know, every single business has the ability to be ethical and have an ethical stance. Um, and it's just down to the people at the top whether they want to make that happen or not. If they don't, it won't. Um, and I thought about the people that are looking at these YouTube movies. Who are they? Well, I think, you know, a large, a percentage, question mark percentage, they are there um, trying to just get an answer to a question. Um, and they get the answer and they move on. That's cool. There's another whole percentage who could probably never afford to pay for a course anyway. Um, if they can find something useful, great, I'm happy. Um, but there will be a percentage that may enroll in our courses because they found those movies. And my question, therefore, has to be, what percentage of people who find those free movies 
then come along and take a course with us that we would not have found before, that would never have heard of us and never have, have, have said, oh, this looks good. If this is the movies, I bet the rest of the course is fantastic. So, um, yeah, you know, th these are the questions that we have to ask when we when we start being really open, I guess. I'm going to speed up a little bit. I, I think about um, big companies like Air New Zealand. I'm, I'm not going to pick on Air New Zealand. I'm just taking them as an example of a big organization that I know fairly well. Um, Air New Zealand could create free courses on travel and tourism. They've got the expertise. They could create courses, free courses on travel and tourism and put them out there in Moodle or whatever. Um, and think of it as soft marketing. Um, so that anyone, you know, any young kids in school could go and do an Air New Zealand course in Travel and Tourism Foundation. Fantastic. And you could say, wouldn't this help their competitors? Well, it may raise the profile of Travel and Tourism as, a, as an industry or as a, as, a, as a vocation. But if there were any quizzes in there, for example, it's only Air New Zealand that's going to capture that data. And therefore, Air New Zealand could use that as part of our recruitment process. They could say anyone that's passed the the Travel and Tourism Foundation course with 95%, you know, these are people that are keen, knowledgeable, IT literate, you know, maybe these are the people we should be looking to employ. So you could use it as part of your recruitment process, for example. <clears throat> Businesses that I think can share, you know, health boards, environmental, we've mentioned. Telecoms companies. Telecoms companies have huge amounts of money and spend an awful lot on public relations and PR and marketing. <clears throat> these are organizations that could that could take these sorts of uh, approaches. Uh, there's a link to badges here. That's, in, that's an interesting comment. Um, it's an interesting comment because of the timing. Um, badges, wow. I was... Um, painfully aware while I was creating this presentation. I'd, I'd been to a couple of the other keynotes and I was really impressed with people's keynotes and slides. Um, so I thought, well, I've got to put effort into at least one slide. Um, so I am um, the open badges. Yeah, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of uh, I, I feel I feel the um, the jury's out on this one a little bit. Um, even even during this conference, I know we've all been excited about badges, but um, I don't know whether they're going to become like confetti. I don't know whether it's going to become a bit like Foursquare. If any of you know Foursquare, it was this kind of application that um, you basically check in places, and the more you checked in, the higher rankings you got, and then you became like the mayor of an area until someone else overtook you with visits. And... Um, um, it, I'm not sure whether badges have actu are actually uh, too faddy or, or too instant and throw away to, 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 to take off and be really useful. I mean, I'm, um, I'm going to be interested to see how it plays out. Um, in that initial question from Julian, he did ask me to talk about social media. I, I, I didn't want to because I guess so many people talk about social media these days. I did just want to think though about um, if we're a, a business and we're, we've we got employees on MOOCs, um, the employees are actually our ambassadors, aren't they? And, and what they do in a public space reflects upon us and reflects upon our business. And um, I think that as if, if these things take off in a, in a business context and if business people are going on MOOCs, that we, we, we're going to need to see some training and monitoring of, of what's happening there because of, because of the dynamic of the employee reflecting upon the organization. Um, I probably don't want to say anything more than that. I think that's, that's a really interesting area, but I don't think we're, we're there in terms of our understanding yet. Um, so I think we can see that Big business can certainly give things away. Maybe small businesses can give things away for free as well and be more open. Um, I've got a friend who's a florist, and um, she's using WordPress for her website. And I thought, you know, she could make little videos on, on, on flower arranging 
and I'm sure there would be some old ladies in town. I don't mean to be uh, dismissive there. That there would be lots of lots of people around local who would want to learn how to arrange flowers, and maybe they will then go and buy flowers from her. Um, you know, there's lots of examples you can think of. A music teacher that does some free free um, tutorials, or a chef who has some uh, tips and recipes uh, online, and then you know sells um, sells weekend residential cooking courses. I definitely need that man. I have to say, my cooking's awful. Um, yeah, so so there are models that smaller organisations can adopt as well. I'm going to skip quite quickly through this section, um, just to say that there are a lot of. Obviously, we know there's a lot of Moodle sites in the world, but just notice that the vast majority of them are less than 500 people. These are not universities. Uh, most of them aren't schools. Uh, most of them are businesses. And um, often small businesses. In fact, if we looked at if we looked at those statistics, we can see the number of sites above a thousand users and below. That ninety percent of Moodle sites have less than a thousand users. Um, I sometimes can't believe that when I look at the forums on Moodle.org, because you would almost think that it's only big institutions and big organisations that use Moodle. Um, it's always important to remember that that we don't. And who are these people? Well. Um, some of them are independent, some of them are companies, some of them are other. In fact, only 42% of schools and universities, um, oh, no, sorry, that's not quite right. 42% are on, yeah, on not um, schools or universities. That, that's, um, you know, that, that's quite a uh, revealing statistic. So, um, as we know, they could be. Training departments, or government departments, libraries, and um, charities, and, and uh, public offices—all popular uh, users of Moodle. Um, and I kind of am going towards the end here and making, you know, in a way, a separate point. Um, I don't think Moodle is is very business friendly. Funnily enough, um, on Moodle.org we have lots of teachers and techies. Um, we don't have as many business people and. Business users are not the target audience for Moodle in terms of its management and direction. Um, the, the fact that the commercial sector now use Moodle is actually a byproduct of its success in the schools and universities, and the fact that it became so well known and, it, and it's so good. Um, but um, I don't think businesses contribute to Moodle either. So, so on Moodle.org, we have lots of teachers and lots of techies who do contribute to Moodle, but uh, businesses often don't. Um, there's like a disconnect between Moodle and business, really. Um, now, uh, there's, um, th there's something that we could do, um, and that is that is trying to align a lot of business users or a group of business users more with Moodle, and. Um, uh, you know, some of the drivers for the analytics and objectives that are going into Moodle now are actually coming from, you know, from a from a, a business uh, perspective. Yes, sure, some of that is also for monitoring students, um, but you know, we do have something there that that benefits both commercial and non-commercial users. Um, now, okay, here's an idea. I'm going to sort of finish off uh, really with this idea. Um, business users have money. Uh, we have some big companies around the world using money, uh, and they could be contributing. Now, I'm going to pick. Uh, oh, just to mention, in New Zealand, if we look at this little map, this suggests that the number of registered sites in America is bigger than anywhere, and then Spain, and then Brazil, and then the UK, and that's cool. Um, I made a comparison with that at the recent Moodle Moot in New Zealand. And if we divide the number of registered sites by the population of a country, um, we get a kind of ratio figure. And that ratio figure shows that the penetration of Moodle, the adoption of Moodle per capita, is highest in Portugal, and then Spain, and then New Zealand, and then Australia, and then the UK, and Colombia. And those figures make um, a lot of sense to me. Um, Almost everyone that you talk to in New Zealand these days understands Moodle or has heard of it. Um, the, the penetration or the uptake, the ratio per 
person is actually really high. And um, that's interesting because we have, I'm just going to pick on two companies in New Zealand, and I'm sure this is going to get back to them. But um, Fonterra, Fonterra is a huge company in New Zealand. It's actually responsible for 30% of the world's dairy export. Yeah, that is correct, the world. We are a little country in New Zealand, about three and a half million people, the size of a, of a city in England or America, and yet we have 30% of the world's dairy export here. Um, the revenue to Fonterra is about 20 billion. It's the biggest company in New Zealand. Um, Orion Health, Orion Health, uh, this year surpassed its 100 million revenue target. Yeah, it is a lot of cows. Um, both of these organizations use Moodle. Uh, both of them use Moodle and use it with their suppliers and for their training. Um, and um, although, although they kind of, kind of contribute to Moodle in terms of the fact that they work with Moodle partners, um, these are companies that are getting a, a, a learning management system for free, the world's best learning management system for free. Now, I think if we went to companies like this and we said to them, would you like to be uh, helping us prioritize some of the changes, some of the improvements in Moodle, some of the new features in Moodle, would you be willing to um, contribute to that financially if we can um, give you some recognition for that as well? Um, yeah, Lynn, that's absolutely right. Um, Google used Moodle for their training, for their staff training. That's um, absolutely what I heard, and um, as far as I know, it's true, at least um, last year. Um, and, and, you know, when we look around the Moodle users uh, in, in just our country, a lot of these are... I mean, the prop, you know, a property development company, a district health board, a council, uh, air traffic controllers. These are all organisations getting the world's best learning management system for free and not making a contribution and possibly not being asked to make a contribution. And I think that's just as, just as key a point, really. Um, okay, nearly finished. I think that, that, Moodle HQ, I, th I think we're missing a big opportunity here as an organization, as a, as a piece of software, as a, as a management group. I think we're missing a big opportunity to get the business community more involved with Moodle, both financially and in terms of, you know, in other ways. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, a good analogy is the fact that, you know, NASA has, um, you know, NASA has been there for years landing on the moon, etc. Uh, money's tighter, and I think everyone now realizes that the next stages of, of space exploration are not going to be funded by central government. They're actually going to be private enterprise. And there's nothing wrong with that, and there's certainly nothing wrong with, with partnerships, uh, you know, in, in these two, two um, areas. So um, this is what I might suggest. And this is only one idea coming out of this very, very big discussion, really. Um, I think we could propose a list of business-related features, features that are still beneficial to all users. And then I think we can get groups of these big, fairly rich, you know, or certainly lucrative, certainly comfortable organizations, get them together, provide them the sponsorship opportunities. You know, this is great for their internal newsletters and their public relations. The people we have to talk to there, of course, are the HR managers and the IT managers because they're the people that see the benefits and can sell the benefits. And I think that we need to credit these uh, these these uh, contributions, whether they're financial or other. We need to credit that on the, in the same way that our developers are credited. I can read forum posts forever on on thank you to our developers, and of course these guys are absolutely vital, but by doing the same thing for people in business, we can give them positive strokes, we can pat them on the head, and we can say thank you so much for helping to support this brilliant learning management system uh, that you've got for free. Thank you for supporting it by your $5,000 donation this year, which has gone towards making, uh, well, let, let's think about what it could make. Um, there are all number of things on the Moodle tracker 
um, if you don't know the Moodle Tracker. Uh, the Moodle Tracker is has feature requests, and there are lists of things that people ask for. You know, like um, can we export outcome report to Excel or CVS? That might be useful for teachers. It might very well be something that's come from the business community. <coughs> Excuse me. As, as essential. And in fact, if we look at feature requests and um, some some of the older ones, you know, here's a feature request. Allow a forum option to allow anonymous posting. Now, I can see that being useful in lots of training scenarios and lots of uh, business situations, right? This original request was made on the 25th of February, 2004. 2004. Um, I think we could find a company using Moodle that would love that facility. And if we said to them, you know, one of the developers could do that for for everyone, and uh, but it's going to cost you three grand. I think we could get it. I I, I do think we can have more of a uh, sensible approach to incorporating the business community in Moodle. So um, that's kind of the end. Um, I, I kind of said the end or the beginning because. Um, I think there's lots of things to think about in here. Lots of things that I've been thinking about over the last few weeks as I've as I've put this together. Um, I think for businesses, um, businesses need to, if if this is going to work, if open is going to make a difference, then we have to have an open strategy, and that forces us to think differently. And it has to be led from the top. It's no use doing it from the bottom. It's no use an individual doing it. These things have to be led from the top of business, um, and and there are real challenges there around our processes and our traditional economic models. And it does change all these things that management books talk about forever, like power and policy, control and ownership, um, how we manage our identity and our brand. Ultimately, if business is going to be more involved in a productive way with open technology or open educational resources or, or open Moodle and so on, it needs a change in terms of hearts and minds, uh, how we do things and why and why we do them. So that kind of finishes um, what I wanted to say, and it was kind of more than I thought I was going to say. Um, now I'm quite, I'm quite happy to give the um, mic over to anyone else that that wants to pick up on any of those points. Uh, I'm quite happy to. Um, just uh, you can just say if you want me to, to pass you the mic. I think I can do that. Um, or if you want to post questions, or, I mean, there's been some fantastic comments and and observations in the chat, which I can't. I'm really dying to read back. Um, uh, I couldn't pick up on all of them, but some of them are really good and really interesting. I'm uh, trying to integrate those into a wider wider document at the end. Anyone questions? <laughs> Shall I put my camera back on? There you go. Thank you. You want? <coughs> Sorry, Dot. I want more. Dot talking about Moodle at other events where business goes. Yeah. Do you know that'd be really good, wouldn't it? I I think that um, Moodle getting more involved with um, some of the the, the HR and the training and the LearnX and the, the big uh, the big educational conferences. I think that would be really interesting. Uh, thanks, George. Uh, thanks, Penny. Yeah, I noticed some good um, good comments from you there, George, which I can't I can't wait to, to read back. To be honest. Um, uh, yeah, um, I, I think that's. I, I don't think it's. I don't think it'd be correct to say most of these are tied up with Moodle partners. Uh, I think some of them are, and um, you know, percentage. It would be interesting to see what sort of percentage. Um, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure most. Yeah, and and you know, there's a couple of points there that that 
now now we've had Moodle for quite a while and we've had open source for quite a while, maybe the people going into those um, training positions, those new HR managers, those new training managers, they are people who get open source and they are people who get Moodle, so maybe they're easier to talk to. Yeah, um, tenders and bids, I think, are a, are a problematic area for Moodle and always will be because, um, uh, because often decision makers in companies, and I'm talking about um, senior management and the accountant uh, and so on, uh, if anyone from IT ever says to them, oh, open source, it's a security issue, um, the instant reaction for those managers who don't know any better is always to run away from anything with the word security. Because if they overrule IT, when IT have used the word security, then their heads are on the block. And um, I think that's a real problem. And it's a very easy, um, <clears throat> it's a very easy word for proprietary systems to throw into their bids. Um, I would be, I would be fairly sure that 90% of the bids that come in from uh, proprietary systems will say, uh, well, we're not open source, uh, but that's, that's because we're a lot more secure, you know, and I think that just sends off alarm bells for, for people, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, you do have to drop, um, I mean, you do have to drop names. You do have to say, well, the Italian Air Force and the Italian Police Force use Moodle. In New Zealand, the Inland Revenue Department uses Moodle. And you do, you do kind of have to reel off these um, excellent examples of, of organizations that, that do use Moodle when, when security is, you know, absolutely paramount for them. That, that argument is, is actually relatively easy to bulldoze if you get the chance. If it's a bidding system and you're not getting a chance, then, then it's a lot more difficult. Yeah, I agree, Gareth. I think um, <clears throat> excluding Windows, which has a huge user base and Windows servers, um, yeah, Linux would be would be the most tested, um, you know, in, in many situations, wouldn't it? Yeah. Use my microphone. Um, okay, so. I know that we have a. I know that there's a forum in the course area. Um, if people want to discuss these things afterwards and put more more comments in there, uh, we can certainly have a discussion in there. And um, I look forward to any any comments you would like to make to me to help because this is the first time I've really looked at open and business and Moodle. So um, you know, in a year's time or maybe a month's time. When I've when I've managed to rethink this and take lots of these comments, hopefully it'll be even better the next time we do it. So yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that was it. Um, I have to apologise for cutting you off there, Stuart. It's uh, Julian here. Um, it's not often. Stuart always does this to me at conferences. He has to drag me off his stages. That's it true. It's very nice to finally be in a position where I can say, Stuart, you're out of time. <laughs> Thank you very much for presenting. Uh, I think, judging especially by the, the comments in the chat, uh, you, you've really reached a, a lot of people in NLP. These, these messages are slowly banging it down the doors <laughs> on, on, yeah. on a corporate enterprise, and it's, it's great seeing that the culture is starting to shift. Uh, the bad news is it literally is less than five minutes before our next session starts. So if you need to get yourself caffeinated, hydrated, um, I won't say urinated, that would be a very bad choice of words. Um, you've got five minutes to get yourself ready for the next session. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Stuart, for your fantastic keynote. And please enjoy the rest of iMood. Thank you very much. And remember, as Stuart mentioned, there are forums in this session course. Keep the discussion going. It doesn't have to die out now. Um, it would be great if you've got these ideas and, 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 and keep them moving. So, everybody, move on. Stuart, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of iMood. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, everyone.